Hello everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Sara Taysir. I'm a pediatrics and neonatology specialist and healthcare consultant on MedSynapse Medical Platform. Today, I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Haysam Saar for one more time on Medical uh, on MedSynapse Medical Platform. Uh, Dr. Haysam Saar is an interventional cardiology consultant working at uh, Dalla Namar Hospital. Welcome, doctor. Um, hi, Sarah. How are you? It's nice being with you again. Thank you, doctor. So today, we're going to talk about, about a very interesting topic, which is palpitation. Uh, first of all, I would like to know what are palpitations. Uh, can you explain it more for us? Yeah. Okay. In main um, in layman terms, palpitation is mainly awareness of heartbeats. Okay. Um, this can be anything like a skip beat, an extra beat, um, uh, awareness of um, racing of the heartbeat. Whether can this can be regular or irregular. Um, in medical terms, um, uh, we are saying that palpitation mm -hmm. is a sense of uh, um, um, irregularity of the heart rhythm or increase in the heart rhythm. This can be in the form of PACs, BVCs, or um, some sort of benign tachycardias like sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, can be atrial fibrillation or some sort of malignant tachycardias as well, especially unsustained VTs and, and, and VTs. And what causes palpitations? What are the main reasons for uh, the palpitations to happen for a normal person, for example? Um, in order to understand palpitations um, at the pathology, we have to go back to physiology Okay. It's a brief introduction just to understand how palpitation um, cycle begins and how it perpetuates. Um, um, there is a balance between two nervous systems that controls our heart, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic uh, nervous system is, uh, is functioning mainly in a state of awareness. It's responsible for the four Fs that we studied in physiology, the fear, fright, uh, flight and, and, and fear. And um, um, the parasympathetic system is the one that's responsible for controlling our heart during resting conditions and mainly during sleep. Um, we have our own circadian rhythms um, um, with increase and decrease of all levels of hormones, especially adrenaline and noradrenaline. Yeah. If there is any disturbance in this circadian rhythm or balance, whether due to natural causes or medical causes, mm -hmm. this may cause palpitation. So, for example, um, uh, if somebody is smoking, um, uh, this may trigger palpitation. If he's uh, taking any recreational drugs, including alcohol, for, for example, again, this can perpetuate palpitations. People who drink um, coffee and tea or consume caffeinated drinks in general, um, like power drinks, for example, uh, power holes, Red Bull and things like this, again, this may trigger palpitation or increase the awareness of the heartbeats. Yeah. Uh, people who have disturbance in their sleep cycle, and those who are taking night shifts, for example, like pilots, nurses, doctors, yeah. um, the all is disturbance in their day-to-day uh, -day, um, life balance, or what we call their biological clock. Yes. Um, um, people who are in continuous state of stress, um, like stress at home, stress at work, in business, and things like this. And, and of course, uh, people who have type A personality, and um, a minority of those patients, they usually have what we call panic attacks. Um, 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 again, all these... Uh, type of patients, they, we call them the, the benign part of the palpitation yeah. um, risk factors or causes. Okay. On the other hand, we have the medical causes of palpitation. Among, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Among them, of course, there is anemia, there is um, um, hypo or hyperfunction of the thyroid, the hypothyroidism or the um, um, hyperthyroidism. And of course, we, we end up with the uh, um, cardiac causes, whether it's a problem with the heart muscle itself, like various causes of uh, various types of cardiomyopathies or the problem with conduction um, um, or the various types of arrhythmias. Okay, and how do I know that I might have palpitations? How do I di uh, differentiate it between normal rhythm and normal heart rhythm and uh, the abnormal one? Um, this usually goes like a clock. You, do, you just don't um, feel that there's something normal, uh, abnormal with, with your heart rhythm unless you have a skip beat an extra beat, yeah. um, abnormal, um, um, let's say, rhythm or rate in your heartbeats. This is when um, you seek medical advice and you go to your doctor to uh, yes. for help. Okay, that's that was my second question. Uh, what when should someone seek medical advice or uh, go to a doctor, visit a doctor when he has palpitation or he experiences abnormal rhythm? Um, whenever there is disturbance of the patient's everyday life uh, uh, or, um, or his um, um, usual norm, um, uh, any deviation from this, um, um, the patient should seek medical advice. I mean, 
most, if not all, um, uh, of the normal population, they'll experience palpitation um, at some stage of their lives. But it's not concerning because it's not interfering with day-to-day -day life activities. Yes. I mean, for example, some will have palpitations after meals, some will have palpitations um, uh, while they're trying to go to sleep or something like this. This may be trivial and it's not triggering anything that mm -hmm. warrants medical attention. But on the other hand, some patients are very sensitive. They have low threshold for um, uh, feeling these arrhythmias. And at the end of the day, they will just seek medical advice, maybe for a few BECs or BVCs, but it's the right um, to seek medical attention. Okay, and uh, do you think that uh, some kids uh, experiencing anemia can have abnormal heart rate? Because this is a very uh, common, uh, I don't know if it's, uh, I hear this a lot from mothers at the clinic that I know that my son has um, some uh, different uh, uh, beat, uh, heartbeats because he has anemia, but it's not always any. I, I don't know, I want to correct this uh, info uh, that uh, it's not because uh, always because you have anemia that the problem in your heart will be due to anemia. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, anemia is a precipitating factor, but it's not a cause in itself. Yes. I mean, um, let's let's let's, for example, let's first say that children in general and, and, and those in the pediatric age group less than 12 or 13, they have higher heart rates yes. um, um, as normal. So we are not talking here about the normal adult heart rate between 60 and 100, and then above 100, we would yes. call this abnormal. No. Um, yeah. um, so to start with, we have to block the patient age and the heart rate on a chart to see mm -hmm. what is the normal heart rate for that age. Then if the patient is having an abnormal, let's say, rhythm, this is something to be dealt with in with cardiology, okay. uh, specifically pediatric cardiology. But if the patient is having an abnormal rate, for example, the normal heart rate is 120, then it's 130, 140. Then we start investigating yeah. other causes, including anemia. And by the way, uh, by anemia, we just don't need uh, mean um, a small drop in hemoglobin, like yes. a one gram or two gram per liter or something like this. We need significant drop of, of hemoglobin to um, um, uh, values like eight or nine before the patient starts having racing of the heart rate. because. At the end of the day, I, I don't want to go into details or, or equations, but the, the cardiac output is, is, a, is a sum of um, stroke volume and the heart rate. So if there is enough bl uh, blood going into the circulation, the, both the stroke volume and the heart rate will be in the yeah. normal range. But if you are having anemia, which means that the effective amount of blood pumped into the circulation is less, yes. that the heart is trying to compensate this by increasing the heart rate. Yeah. So that's why most of these patients, especially anemic patients, they get palpitations or tachycardia in general. Yes, okay. And are there any lifestyle changes or medication that uh, help man in the management of palpitations? Um, well, if the patient is coming to see us in the clinic, usually, um, I mean, 95% of the patients, they don't have any malignant cause or something of concern but they just want to make sure that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. So we start by taking history and going through all these five or six um, um, non-medical um, causes or triggers that we have discussed before. Smoking, yeah. caffeinated drinks, um, um, yeah. enough sleep time and, and quality, um, um, the stress in life and the, um, the, um, the presence or absence of irritable bowel syndrome or panic attacks or anything like this. Okay. If the patient is having one of these, we just inform the patient or educate the patient about how to deal with these things and how to tackle those problems in order to, again, resume or restart the, uh, the, uh, the, the balance in yeah. the biological block and, the, uh, and in, to normalize the circadian rhythm. On the other hand, if, if the patient is having medical conditions, we deal with it by uh, ordering um, uh, investigation in a certain order in order to be able to verify and treat the cause of arrhythmia, if any. Yeah, I sometimes uh, have palpitations because I drink too much coffee and uh, I'm a mother and I'm a doctor and I'm always stressed. So sometimes I, I, I experience this, especially at night when I try to uh, sleep. And it makes me a little bit uh, scary and uh, I feel like I, I cannot breathe. But uh, for one, once in a while, I go to make some investigation to make sure that everything is okay. But here, uh, doctors are, always tell us, uh, you are a woman, so you are always in stress. They will always experience these palpitations. Um, one of the caveats is that we don't take the, uh, the patient's concern or the patient's symptoms seriously. I mean, yeah. uh, we have to believe the patient's symptoms at the end of the day. patient wouldn't come to the clinic just because he just wants to come to see a doctor yeah. unless um, he's having something genuine. So yeah. we have to respect the patient's symptoms all the time and we should investigate it if we feel that it's a yeah. real concern to the patient. Even if we are, I wouldn't say 100%, but maybe 95% sure that there's something, yeah. nothing malignant. And can you discuss, doctor, without the importance of monitoring heart rhythm at home? And um, is there any well, device that can help uh, patients to monitor their heart rate or heart rhythm at home? Yeah, 
uh, when we start investigating those patients, we start with uh, simple blood tests like um, complete blood count and thyroid function tests just to make sure that the patient doesn't have anemia, hyper hyperthyroidism or anything like this. Then we, we go to a simple ECG just to have a look at, at the patient rhythm, whether it's regular, irregular, showing any um, um, uh, extra systoles or BECs or BVCs or anything like this. Um, uh, sometimes we may even do an echo if there is a, um, a possibility of a heart muscle dysfunction mm -hmm. um, uh, just to make sure that the patient doesn't have any uh, form of cardiomyopathy. Yeah. Then um, we insert what we call a hold. This is a device which we um, hook up to the patient uh, under his clothes. It's not apparent. The patient yeah. can do his um, normal daily activities and this can be either for 24, 48 or even sometimes 72 hours. Okay. This halter um, records the patient's activities it's like a video of his of all his um, his heartbeat and rhythms, uh, and then we analyze this halter, and through this analyze um, uh, analyzation, or uh, um, we come to a conclusion. Okay. Sometimes, patient come to us and he's telling, um, "I have these palpitations once in a while, maybe every week, maybe every yeah. two weeks, sometimes even longer periods of time, like a month or even two months." Mm -hmm. In that case, a halter wouldn't be um, um, a good choice in those type of patients. So what we have, what we have now, is an implantable loop recorder or ILR. This is a something like a, um, a flash memory or a stick that's implanted under the skin of the patient, and it can stay there up to five years. It doesn't have any side effects of, or complications, and the patient can have his do normal daily activities. Um, mm -hmm. um, once the patient is having, let's say, an attack of palpitations, he come back to us. We analyze the um, 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 the rhythm from the device, and we may know what's going on with the patients. Okay, this is this is absolutely great. And you analyze it through uh, scanning through. Uh, and you take out the the this piece of uh, device. We don't or... have to take out the device. It can stay there. We just have something like a device that's put on the a magnet that's put on the device that can retrieve all the information from the implantable okay, recorder nice. without having to take it off unless of course we reach a diagnosis and the ilr is no longer needed so yeah. we can take it okay so what's the long-term outlook for people who experience palpitations can expect these symptoms to improve over time because they, can these um, people can we assure these people that over time they will uh, they will uh, no more experience these palpitations well, uh, again, if this palpitation is mainly due to irregularity of uh, uh, um, uh, the circadian rhythm or an imbalance of the biological clock or something like this, with simple measures, um, um, everything can go back to normal. Just okay. try to stop smoking or at least cut it down. Um, for people like you who's taking caffeine, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we advise them not to take it after four or five o'clock in order to be able to get a good night's sleep without any disturbance yes. uh, by the palpitation. Um, 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 other people, we, we advise them to um, sleep tight and uh, at least six to eight hours according to the needs and yeah. to the age, of course. Um, people who are in, in stress, um, we just try to tell them that you have to minimize this amount of stress. I wouldn't tell anybody to change their job just because he's having palpitation, but at yeah. the end of the day, if the feedback mechanisms are not enough, maybe we refer him to behavioral therapy mm -hmm. and sometimes even we refer them to psychiatrists to, to prescribe some medications to help them um, um, uh, cope with this stress okay. and have a good night's sleep. Yeah. Okay. On the other hand, uh, we are talking about now 5% of patients. If the patient is anemic, we try to correct anemia. If the patient is having hyper hyperthyroidism, we deal with this as well. And finally, this is a very, very minor percent of patients if the patient is having something related to his heart whether it's a heart muscle problem or um, a conduction abnormality we refer them to the specialist um, 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 like an electrophysiologist for example for an yeah. electrophysiology study plus or minus ablation if needed okay and uh, what are the long-term complications of palpitations if i ignore um, them if i experience palpitations and i kept i keep on ignoring these symptoms most of the time, nothing will happen because, as we said, 95% of the patients, they have just occasional extra stalls, sinus tachycardia or something like this. But on the other hand, if the patient is having persistent tachycardia or persistent abnormalities of the rhythm, or the percentage of time those PVCs or BECs occupies through the halter um, uh, uh, we analyze is more than 10%, sometimes those patients develop what we call um, um, arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy. Those patients will eventually have drop in their addiction fraction and they weren't further investigations. This, of course, if we are talking about benign, uh, benign tachycardias, that's called in cardiomyopathy. On the other hand, there are malignant tachycardias like the non-sustained VT and the sustained VT. These can be life-threatening and the patient may 
um, either present with syncope or presyncope and sometimes even sudden cardiac death. Mm -hmm. So according to the anal analyzation or the analysis of this um, 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 rhythm, the plan of action or the plan of management is tailored according to the patient's um, own rhythm and to the um, um, severity and gravity of the, uh, of the condition itself. Um, you may end up taking some medication and that's it. Um, um, especially, specifically if you know the blocking agent like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, and you may end up having an electrophysiology study with ablation of a focus or even sometimes implantable um, uh, cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular defibrillator, what we call an ICD. Um, um, uh, so it's it's a wide range, but in, in, to, uh, to reassure the patients or to reassure the normal population, 95% of the time you take nothing, just try to adjust your circadian rhythm and the uh, um, uh, biological clock and everything yeah. will be okay. Okay, and do you think, doctor, that uh, there is um, a more percentage of uh, these palpitations happening in women more than men, or uh, it's the same? I mean, the benign force type, not uh, the serious one or the medical one. We see all types of patients in different age groups in, in the clinic. I wouldn't say it is a little bit, yes, more common in females, maybe because of the, the threshold of, uh, of pain sensation and awareness of the yeah. heartbeats, irregularities are a little bit more. Mm. Um, but this doesn't mean anything. I mean, at the end of the day, palpitation is palpitation, and uh, and and if you have any concern or symptoms, you should seek medical advice. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, doctor, I would like to thank you so much for this uh, amazing podcast. Always uh, very informative, and uh, I um, I look forward for another one with you to know more and more uh, about cardiology. Thank you so much, doctor. Very much. It was nice seeing you again.